Well, welcome everyone to another podcast. I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek, and this is the Rod and Staff podcast. I have a special guest today. They're all special, but uh, this is a friend I made recently named uh, Dr. Randy Bunch. He's uh, living out there in Southern California, but he has a ministry to several nations, and he's got a unique approach to ministry, so I'm going to have him tell you about it. But uh, welcome to the podcast, Randy. Thank you, Rod. It's wonderful to be with you today. And um, I haven't had a chance really to go over all of his resume, so I just asked uh, Randy if, if he would <laughs> tell us and just uh, fill us in on his background and all the things that he's doing today. Sure. Well, Rod, I've been a Christian most of my life. I was raised as a good Southern Baptist boy until on April Fool's Day, 1984. God changed that when I got filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking with other tongues, and it totally, of course, changed the complete trajectory of my life, as you might imagine. Right. And uh, it, wasn't long, it wasn't long after that that I ended up going to Rainbow Bible Training Center, where I graduated in 1987, uh, later got my uh, bachelor, uh, bachelor's and master's in theology at Life Christian University, and then ended up with my doctorate of divinity at Summit Bible College, which I, where I also serve as a professor of Christian apologetics and other subjects as well. And uh, so that's kind of a little bit about my educational background. Great. So you're another Rama alumnus. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you were a few years behind me. I graduated in 84. Yeah, yeah. So uh, tell, uh, tell my subscribers and viewers out there in YouTube land uh, what it is that you're doing uh, today as far as your outreach overseas. Yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating. It's something that kind of just came at a time in my life. You know, Rod, for the most of my life, I've been a church planter, pastor. I was in itinerant traveling ministry for six years, both the United States and a little bit abroad, and um, had the opportunity to go over to India at a certain point and connect with some people. I was on television over there. I had a tremendous um, expression ministry through television in the southern part of India, and that really I saw as such a wonderful way of getting so much bang for my buck, if you will, reaching so many people for so little cost with really relatively little effort, you know, just producing a simple, pro and I mean back then, we're talking really simple, low production quality, but just doing the best we could to get the message of healing, get the message of the gospel to people overseas. And so that never left me. And in more recent times, I reconnected with those same friends and asked them, hey, are you guys still broadcasting? And they were. And uh, so we, you know, reconnected with them. Now they're broadcasting, as so many people are, both via television and through the Internet. And so we produce a, cha a, a program, Connecting Point TV, which goes on YouTube, and then it's downloaded by them and other networks now as well. And uh, in India, we're, into, we're going into a, over a million homes in southern India. Uh, we're now, they partnered with another network, so we're going into Bangladesh, Malaysia, Singapore, parts of Australia, and then more recently, I just connected with another network called uh, Kingdom Building TV, uh, and that's a network that um, the nephew of Keith Butler, who has the large Word of Faith Church up in Detroit, runs, and uh, they are now broadcasting to a potential audience of 100 million. So God has really given us a very large footprint. We're reaching, reaching into a lot of nations through the broadcast, and uh, in addition to we're doing uh -oh. site crusades uh, into Pakistan, which is tremendous. You want me to tell you a little bit more about that? Yeah. Uh, one thing that I don't really understand is how your ministry works via Skype. You said uh, on your website yeah. that you yeah. broadcast via Skype. So how does that work? Because you've got people there, like boots on the ground, that can uh, follow up. Yeah, very much so. Uh, my part of that is relatively insignificant compared to the responsibility of the people that are there in Pakistan. You know, Rob, with any of these kinds of ministries, as you can imagine, it really comes down to having the right connections uh, with nationals, people that are in the country, like you said, boots on the ground, people that can do the follow-up. And so I connected some time back with a ministry, and I, you have to be a little bit careful when you're dealing with nations like Pakistan, obviously, where there's, uh, I think it's number five on Open Doors, list of persecuted um, uh, countries, but nevertheless, a wonderful evangelist and his wife over there that actually do large crusades, um, but what was lacking was uh, they wanted to be able to go into the smaller villages where the large crusades that they do, uh, 
uh, are not possible. So what we did basically, it, uh, yeah, I always kind of joke and say it's amazing what you can do with a good internet connection, a laptop, and a bed sheet, and a, a projector. And so that's exactly what happens. In fact, tomorrow morning, we'll be doing our next Skype crusade. So I'll roll out of my bed somewhere at 6 a.m. I'll come and sit in front of a computer just like I'm doing with you right now. And around 8 a.m., I'll get the call, and it'll be a three-way Skype call. And there'll be me sitting in front of a new group of Pakistanis in some village outside of a given city uh, with an interpreter online, and I'll begin preaching. And I'll preach for about 30 minutes, and there's a team there that comes and sets us all up. They're a, a part of that evangelist network that I work with. And uh, I'll preach for about 30 minutes. I'll pray for the sick. I'll lead them in a sinner's prayer. And, uh, and then when I'm done, um, they'll take over and they'll do the follow-up. And we also try to send resources, some funds to help with di uh, Bible distribution. Some of our, our partners help us with that as well. So we're able to set a couple few hundred dollars each month, hopefully. Most of the time we're able to, uh, to help supply Bibles to the new believers that are getting uh, born again through these crusades. So we started last year, 2018, in September. And as of now, we've seen between 14 and 1,500 come to Christ. Hundreds of dramatic healings are just out of this world. Um, it's just so wonderful. We're living in the book of Acts still. Praise God. That's, that's exciting. And, and you did that from the comfort of your, of your own home. That's what's fascinating to me. Yeah, it, it really is. I remember one time I was talking to the pastor, that, or I call him pastor. Uh, he, he's also a pastor as well. But I was talking to him, and he was saying, yeah, our team's traveling three hours to get to this location. And I'm here feeling guilty because I just rolled out of bed, had a cup of coffee while I'm waiting for them to come online. <laughs> And uh, so, yeah, it is, you know, their end of it, obviously, the commitment level is much greater, and the risk is much greater on their end as well. Right. Now, do they, do they set up like a big screen in a, in a, like a conference room, or how does that work? No, it's, all, it's almost always, it's always outdoor. I think we've had maybe one that was indoor. Sometimes you'll hear the dogs barking in the background. I mean, it's very rustic settings, as you can imagine. They're usually sitting in the dirt in a field somewhere. Usually there'll be a wall background of some kind. They'll throw a bed sheet literally over that. I mean, it's what it looks like to me when I've seen it, because I'll get photos back. They'll take photos and send me the report. That's how I know how many are saved, how many are healed. It usually takes about two to three weeks to get those reports, usually before the next crusade begins. And uh, so usually I'm looking at a new scene each time. And so it's a new crowd, a new group of faces. And what's always interesting to me, Rod, is what I'm looking at is through the laptop that they're hooking the projector up to. So I'm not really seeing the whole crowd. I'm literally seemingly inches away from a handful of people that are staring into this monitor. And what's really beautiful is there's always a moment of awkward silence when I first come on, and they're kind of testing the audio. And then one of us, either they or me, will begin waving. And then there'll just be this chorus of waves. You know, it's wonderful. It's just awesome to see. And they're so excited, as you can imagine, so receptive. And it's just the easiest thing in the world. It's like it's literally picking the fruit off the low-hanging branches, as it were, because they've laid the groundwork, they've prepared the soil. And we're just coming on and preaching and reaping the harvest, and it's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, now, are most of these people from a Muslim background, or do you have Hindus, or a mixture, or what? You know, I'm really glad you asked that, because I'm about to, about to bring this up. But, you know, when you think of Pakistan, at least I always have thought, you know, Muslim nation, right? And in fact, if India and Pakistan had not been separated when India gained its independence, it would be the largest Muslim nation in the world. But as you know, it split. India became more Hindu. Pakistan was really more the Muslim nation mm -hmm. in the world. And so when I thought of Pakistan, I thought strictly Muslim. But every single month, we have people that are getting delivered from black magic. Um, some people, one, one individual practiced for 39 years and got saved, healed, delivered. I mean, just glorious things taking place. So there, I would say, is probably a mixture. Particularly, these are rural villages. So I imagine there's animism and, you know, this black magic. Also, what they call grave worship um, is very much uh, a part of their, you know, the, the mix, if you will. And so it's really a hodgepodge of different things. And um, so that the gospel, thank God, addresses all those needs. So Amen. But it makes it all that much more important to do follow-up because yes. people bring so yeah. many different uh, worldviews and theologies into That's right. conversion. Well, as probably, you, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with this, I get literally hundreds upon hundreds of requests. I don't even know how we get out there, you know, but we've got hundreds of requests from other ministers in nations like Pakistan, Africa, and other places asking us to do things like this. 
But until we have a connection with those people and know something of their doctrine, something of, you know, just the consistency of their own lives and ministry, we don't feel comfortable doing that. So really, we work with the team that we work with in India that does the television broadcast. We work with the Pakistani group that does the Skype Crusades. And for the most part, and then, of course, the new network that's American-based, and we know their ministry well. But other than that, we are very limited in who we connect with until we kind of get to know them. Uh, both with the group in Pakistan and India, they've been house guests uh, with me. They've, you know, been here, eat my food, fellowship with me. I've known them for a long time. Same thing with our friends in India. We're very close, very dear to them. Their children call me uncle. You know, it's a very close relationship. Known them for many, many years. I've gone over there in India and preached a couple of times and done meetings in those local churches. And so, yeah, it's very important to know the people, know their um, stability, know their doctrine, so that, you know, you're partnering with someone who's going to do the right thing. Right. Now, tell us a little bit about your apologetics background. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, Rod, like you know, I, like you said, I'm, I'm a Rambo boy, and, uh, you know, I love the ministry of Brother Hagen. And, in fact, actually, even after at least 10 to 12 years of very uh, intensive apologetic study, I've, I've grown to appreciate his ministry even more just because of the depth of insight uh, that man had in the Word of God, and I appreciate that tremendous foundation. But I would say about 10 years ago, I began to realize that I was a Rama boy for the most part, having pastored Rama churches, speaking in other Rama churches, sp you know, speaking Rama speak to Rama people, or w full gospel, charismatic talk to those who already kind of had the background. And it kind of dawned on me that as the culture has changed, you know, I always tell people this is not your grandmother's America anymore. And as we've, you know, lost more and more of our biblical foundations and moved more to a progressive secular uh, worldview in our nation, I realized I don't really know that I have the language to talk to somebody that does not have somewhat of a believer's background. And God just began to put an appetite in my heart. So I began to listen to guys like John Lennox, Robbie Zacharias, Oz Guinness, uh, you know, people from the worldview and uh, apologetics background. Um, and then more recently, I graduated from the Colson program. Uh, so I'm a Colson fellow now as well. Chuck. And uh, just values. Yeah, Chuck Colson. Yeah, just tremendous, uh, you know, uh, biblical worldview personality. So strong on that. And so I, I just think it's so important, really. I think it's uh, just. Uh, uh, it should be a mandate for every pastor to have to learn apologetics, really every believer, you know, to be able to speak to the culture. Right, because so many people these days, even in America, so many people are not familiar with what Christianity teaches. We just right. sometimes that everybody has a, a basic understanding of Jesus right. and the Bible, and maybe 50 years ago in the United States that was the case. But these days... Right especially overseas, that's not the case. And here in America, right. you can talk to people sometimes that all they know is that Jesus was a guy that lived a couple thousand years ago. If he existed at all, some of them doubt that right. he ever, you know, that, that, uh, that he was a real man at all. So you have to deal with a lot of the ignorance that people bring into the discussion uh, before right. you can give people really a framework for faith. Uh, that's... that's right. uh, if you don't change with the times, and, and I'm not talking about styles and fashions, I'm talking about right. being aware of the changing world views. If you don't change, That's right. adapt, you're going to not, you, like your connecting point, the name of your, your site there, you're not right. going to be able to make a connection because you're not going to be talking uh, you know, uh, on familiar terms with the person that you're, that you're sharing the gospel with. That's exactly right. That's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, you know, when I was with the Jews, I became like a Jew. When I was with the Gentiles, I, I preached from a context of what was it like to look at life through their shoes. He said, I didn't get entangled with their way of life. I didn't compromise the gospel, but I just learned their perspective so that I could communicate in a way that's relevant to them. And I heard a minister some years ago say something that I thought was so beautiful. He said, the world you cannot enter is the world you cannot reach. Right. And so we need connecting points with people, points of commonality. And so as you said, about, you know, even 10, 20 years ago, the deck was stacked in our favor in, in, the, in America. You, you didn't have to give all the background. You didn't have to know the minutia of the Christian faith, the meta narrative, and be able to, you know, have all that knowledge at your quick disposal, because for the most part, people accepted that the Bible was authoritative. They, they had some measure of respect, some modicum of the idea that Jesus is the Savior, that kind of thing. And so you didn't have to do a lot of persuasion. They may not want to surrender to him, 
but you didn't have to persuade him that he was God, that God was real, that Jesus was the Savior. It's a completely different deal now. And um, the, the, the tables have turned, and I think the American church has not been prepared for that. And so now we have to really get up to speed, and I think really, to be honest with you, we're, we're really behind the eight ball on this. Right. Yeah, we uh, we just have brought a lot of assumptions into the equation that don't need to be there. Yeah. And, That's right. Uh, like one thing I've talked about a lot on my site is or on my YouTube channel is secularism, that uh, we think sometimes the biggest threat to Christianity is Islam or some other religion, the cults. It used to I mean, I remember back in the 70s, there was this cult explosion you know, you yeah. had the Mormons, you had the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, you had Scientology, and uh, you had the Mormons, and, and all kinds of variants of all of those. And you don't see that so much anymore. Now it seems like right. the biggest threat is secularism, the, the atheist or agnostic worldview that people just don't right. think religion is relevant. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, I teach Christian apologetics at the Bible college that I'm a professor at, and one of the things that, you know, of course, we always lead with First Peter 3.15, and we're to be able to give a defense for the, reason, for, for the reason of the hope that we have in Christ. That word defense, of course, is apologia, from which we get the word apologetics, and it literally means to be like a lawyer presenting your case. How does he do that? He uses testimony and evidence. And so we use not only our own testimony, but the witness of Scripture, uh, the evidence of, of what we call natural theology or the sciences. And as you said, secularism... Find its, finds its scientific foundation uh, in Darwinism and so forth. And so we have to be able to give biblical reasons uh, for the existence of God. So I spend a lot of time talking about what we call the cosmological argument, you know, talking about the origins of the universe, how science is more and more pointing to what we call the God hypothesis, showing that God is the, uh, you know, the uncreated first cause of our universe, uh, the teleological argument, the design features of our universe, that it's so finely tuned for human life that it's beyond uh, possible that it they could have happened by chance. And so we use these arguments to kind of dismantle, if you will, the foundations of secularism, which is scientism, the idea that science and science alone can give us good answers for today. Right. Yeah, now one thing, uh, those of you who've watched my videos, watched my podcast, you've noticed I'm, I'm trying to introduce you to different people that have a, a background with apologetics. Uh, first it was Marcus, and then it was Jason, the former Calvinist, and uh, the last one was Jay Stillinger, who's a pastor up in New York. Jay actually told me about Randy, and uh, so I invited Randy into our group, and uh, while, while Jay is pastoring a church, a local church up there in New York, Randy has this unique uh, ministry, I, I guess you have a somewhat of a ministry there in California as as well yeah. as what you do internationally. And uh, that's right. I actually, actually you know, I was going to say, yeah, I actually pastor a couple of churches. I call that my day job. Uh, we have an outreach in our local community, and then in the neighboring community, we pastor church as well. We oversee two churches, but really, the the thrust of our ministry is the outreach. And like you said, we have the the international outreach was kind of the evangelistic arm of the ministry of Connecting Point Communications, we call it. But the magazine is really um, the, what we would call the, the the side of our ministry that really addresses the challenge to that, that, that American Christianity is facing, like you said, relativism, secularism. So mm -hmm. our magazine, Connecting Point Magazine, really the challenges to the American church today. Okay. We had a little bit of a glitch there. Randy's having a thunderstorm out there in yeah. Southern California, so I think that's causing a little bit of interference, but we'll, yeah. we'll, get, we'll get through it. Now, Randy, you were telling me uh, about uh, the anointing that you have in the area of healing, uh, divine healing. How do you find that that plays into evangelism? What's your experience with that? Hugely. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background. When I was first filled with the Holy Spirit, Rod, very shortly after that, I was praying in the Spirit one day, and the Spirit of the Lord gave me what I would call a special commissioning along the lines of healing. He said to me, in the last days, the ministry of divine healing will come under tremendous attack, and I've called you to stand in the defense of that ministry. Well, of course, we've seen that happen again and again, various ministers coming attacked, but really, I feel like what the Lord was saying is that he wanted me to defend the truths of divine healing. 
And, you know, I wasn't teaching on apologetics then, but years later, when I understood the word apology, I realized what God was really asking me to do was be an apologist for divine healing. Mm-hmm. And then some years later, while I was in the traveling ministry, I was praying one day, and the Lord said this to me, Rod. He said, healing will be your back door to evangelism. And, and I kind of knew what he meant because of all the offices of ministry that one could occupy, the one that I felt I was the least associated with was that of the evangelist. Even though I've been raised in a Southern Baptist context where, you know, Billy Graham was our golden boy, and we had guys like James Robinson and all these wonderful evangelists, I knew that I was called to be a teacher. And the times where I tried to step into an evangelist role just to, you know, meet expectations of my denomination was a colossal failure. And so I always wondered, how can I do what Paul told Timothy, um, and that is, you know, do the work of an evangelist? So that was a real answer to me. And he gave me four reasons why healing would be the back door to my to evangelism. He said, number one, it addresses a universal need. Like Raymond T. Ritchie said, when you start preaching healing, it's like the dinner bell. You ring the dinner bell, folks come running, you know. And uh, he said, number two, it's a demonstration of the Lord's compassion. Jesus was moved with compassion and healed their sick. He said, number three, healing is an evidence of canceled sin. Because after all, sickness and disease came into the human experience through sin. As John Alexander Dowie said, sickness and disease is the foul offspring of its mother's sin and its father Satan. So if sin is the root, then redemption has to be the answer. And so because uh, of the work of the cross, we have not only the forgiveness of sin, but the healing of our bodies. And then lastly, he said, um, in regard to healing, he said healing is also a confirmation of the gospel. And of course, we know from Mark 16 that among the other signs that accompany the preaching of the gospel to give it divine validation, they'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So most of the time, uh, Rob, both in my television broadcast and overseas when I'm doing these Skype crusades, I'm really kind of preaching on healing or the gospel through the avenue of healing. And we find that it's a beautiful net to cast out for the harvest, if you will. Right. Can you just share with us uh, some of the some of the cases that you've seen? Absolutely. When we first started broadcasting in India, uh, Rod, we began to get testimonies. In fact, I put a few in one of my books called uh, The Gospel Saving Power. And let me just give you a couple testimonies that are just so outstanding. Um, when we first broadcasted, I knew we would get testimonies back because I knew the word would work. And so we were really just kind of waiting with bated breath to get some kind of testimony from India where we were broadcasting. And the very first one, well, actually the second testimony I got was from an Indian man named Panraj. Now, back then, we're talking in the aughts, you know, probably around 2005, 2006, 2007. Uh, they, not everybody had a computer in their home in India. You know, you have to go to Internet Cafe. But he told me this testimony. He said, I was flipping through the channels, and all of a sudden he had problems with his knees. He couldn't walk. And he was flipping through the channels, and there wasn't anything on. And he, got, and he came to my program, saw it for a moment, was going to flip past it, but the remote wouldn't work anymore. So because he couldn't walk well and didn't want to bother to get up and change the channel, he was more or less stuck watching me. And so here I am preaching the gospel of healing and everything. He's listening to the broadcast. And this is what he told me, Rod. He said, I always, he said, I never believe these miracles in the name of Jesus. He's a Hindu. He said, uh, but when you, he said, when you uh, prayed the prayer at the end, I prayed with you and I said, Jesus, heal me. And he said, I thought it was a dream. But he said, I saw a hand reach out and take me and raise me up out of my bed. He wow. said, four days later, I'm still walking. He said, now what must I do? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm getting this email late at night, and I literally get on my keyboard as fast as I can and type out a response and a sinner's prayer. And I said, pray this earnestly from your heart. And then I typed the address of my friends there in India, and he fortunately was not that far away. So the next Sunday he went there. They prayed a prayer very similar with him that I had prayed with him. And he said, when I prayed that prayer with them, I felt something funny inside. And obviously he came to Christ. Glorious, you know, testimony of the mm-hmm. efficacy of healing as a tool of evangelism. And that's just one of, I mean, I have dozens and dozens of these testimonies, but my favorite one happened, uh, a father sent me a testimony. His daughter, Jasmine, had a brain fever, and she was in the hospital and uh, kind of like, I guess, in terrible agony. And he said they were giving her drips, so I assume morphine or something to try to control the pain. And he said, we always recorded your television broadcast 
So they literally wheeled in a television set with a VCR and played one of my broadcasts. And at the end, when I prayed the prayer for healing, they all prayed with me. When they opened their eyes, she was sitting up and praising the Lord, totally healed, and the people, the two people in the adjacent room were also healed. So, I mean, it's just the power of the gospel. Amen. Well, thanks for sharing. Uh, we're about out of time here. We try to keep these uh, under 30 minutes if possible. Sure. I'm going to have all of the uh, information on how you can contact Randy, uh, how you can access his materials on his website and so forth. And uh, hopefully you get a chance to, to watch him in action someday. Uh, we'll, have you, we'll have you back, Randy. We'll, I love these stories. We'll have you talk more Praise about Lord. what you're doing in your life and your ministry out there. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll keep you guys uh, apprised of everything that's happening, not only with Randy's ministry, but uh, with uh, Jay Stillinger and Marcus and uh, Jason Peterson as well. Uh, and I've got a few more people that I'm going to bring in to share some of the things that they're going through as well. So thanks again for joining us. We'll see you guys next time.